<laughs> so if we can start again. Uh, we said that weaning is the next, is the physical thing that puts the child into the next phase. You can just say a few things about weaning specifically. In the Old Testament, or in the, in the biblical times, when they talk about weaning, it's obviously breastfeeding and not doing it anymore. I want to say, when you take away all the things that a baby is dependent on, that is to be the weaning phase. In other words, that special blanket that they sleep with, it's fine if they can still sleep with it until they are 10, but they, there comes a time when it's no longer necessary to, to have it there. They will sleep without it, in other words, if I can just say it easier. <laughs> okay, the dummy, the bottle. I'm in no hurry. And, and let me tell you, with the first ones, I, I was also, oh my goodness, I mean, when, when that miracle number two strikes, they have to be rid of everything. The nappies, the bottles, the dummies, and if you can, even before that. Um, I, I have changed my mind on that a lot. In the Hebrew culture, they do things differently. We do it backwards. And I choose to believe that in the Old Testament, God taught them how to live their lives. And, and it, we should look at that. Because He told them, and He said to them, Go tell the world how to live their life, I told you. And they didn't quite do that always, but it still means that God showed them. And all those rules and all those laws, some of them are no longer applicable, but we could look at them and still put them in context in our lives so they're not to be you know, all rulish. But, um, but one of the things they do is when, when children are young, they allow them to be babies as long as that child wants. Okay? They are not in such a hurry to have them grow up. But with us, it's a bragging thing. It's like, oh, you know, my child, it's already crawling. Oh, you know, my baby, oh, throw the nappies away, oh, so wonderful. And you know, really, who are you fooling? You know, it's, it's just making life very difficult for yourself, number one. Number two, what's the big deal <laughs> to, to, to show that you've now passed this phase? I had a four-year-old, <laughs> and that was really very funny. Because the other children then caught on to this, and uh, one day we were driving in the car, and she said, I'm a baby. And she was four. So we said, uh, <coughs> really? So well, then, and we decided to make this now very, very hard for her. And we said, well, then you can't have ice cream. You can't have cookies. And you can't have this and that. And we the sweets, you know, we, we took all the nice things, which was a bit of a lie also, because obviously, you know, Younger babies could also have that. But we wanted to make it as difficult for her as possible. And she just stuck to her line. I'm a baby. <laughs> and I looked at her and I realized that she was not yet ready to go to the next phase. And the more I pushed and the more I tried to make it happen, the more she dug in her heels. And you will see that happen. You will see them. It, it becomes a battle. They, they just become whining. They become, they, oh, you know, they, they cry about everything. They're just not ready. And, and we try to push them. And, and even body training takes longer. And it's a hassle. And they're not ready. Because we now, we've, we've got them an expensive disposable nappies. I mean, we want this over. <laughs> we can think of much better things to do with our money. Yes, we can. Yes, it's, it's great. Um, I remember my mother told me that my, my father's grandfather, they lived on the farm, and when the babies turned one, one people, they cut up the cloth nappies and made it a, a, a little, you know, brookie thingy. And, and that was the end of the nappy, at one. So they can do a lot of things. But is that really what we want? Then, when they get to <coughs> one of the later phases, and we now have to let them grow older and, and independent, then we tell them, no, I don't know, you're not there enough. You can't decide for yourself. You're a child. Then we don't want them to grow. But in this phase, let them be a baby. Let them be a baby. They will not go to school as they... People always have the saying, they will not go to school with a dummy. And it's true. They don't. 
Somewhere between the ages, at the latest of four to five, <coughs> they shed those things all on their own. They, children as old as that, sometimes they just throw it in the bin and they think it's a big joke. Because by then, it's really a joke. They really don't need it anymore. But it's an emotional thing, okay? There's something that must happen. They must take up the responsibility of the older phase. If they're not ready, they really struggle in the next phase. So leave them those things that still keep them a little baby, that's still very dependent and very protected by the mother and the father. Because that's the thing. When you get your children, the babies, they are right here. And actually, they are right here, close to you. You keep them here until that age, that weaning phase. That's what the weaning is about. They need you. They must be with you. They want the mother especially and as much of the father as possible. Okay? They're not oh, just grow up so that we can start playing. No, it's important that we touch them and hold them as much as possible. I once read an article that uh, uh, this, this lady was at the head of a very big educational, I think, it, uh, I'm not sure if it was the whole country or it was just a specific province, but she was the head of the pre primary um, education. And she made a public statement. She said there's only two ways that children develop after birth. Only two ways their brains develop further. Interestingly enough, I didn't say it, she said it. She said, and the one is, and later on the, the, the uh, what do you call them, um, I think therapy, the physical therapy, more or less those things. They, they said, but it's true, it's, that's what they are taught, is that it only develops by way of physical touch. Physical touch, in other words, like holding on to them as much as possible. And, um, uh, Clement Clouter, playing, they must roll, they must climb in the trees, they must hang on by the, you know, hang on their legs and, and, and you know, turn around, you know, make cartwheels and, and then roll over and things like that. That's the only two ways that their brains develop further. So in this phase, we, we try to get them to grow up and we push them because, you know, this is, it's, it's a lot because they have no button to, to put them off. <laughs> it's very intimidating. You know, it's nice in the beginning that this little being can so be so dependent on you. It's a huge compliment. <coughs> but after a few months, it is no longer a compliment. <laughs> you know, you just want them to leave you alone, even before an hour it will be enough. But please, can I just have a nap? Or can I just go to the bathroom on my own? Can I just go to the shop without you tagging along? <laughs> and you can't, because they want to be with you. Good. You get the message. Right, so now we win them and they know what's right and wrong. We will get back to that phase which is very important. I just want to stress that again. Then when we get to the child phase, which is now somewhere between the age of two to four, and we can write it here so that you can see it here, between the age of somewhere between two to four, they get to the next phase, which is quite simply the child phase. Very simply put, you'll see that in the word, we will have lots of explanations on that. Okay, the child phase, they have now been weaned and they are now a child. This is actually, for, well, I love every phase of children, but this is one of the more um, common phases. Can I put it like that? It's like the... This phase can be quite a thing if you, it's, it's very intense, there's a lot of training involved, especially with discipline, and we'll talk about it next week, but there's a lot of intenseness in this phase, and, and they grow up such a lot, they, they develop so much, and they ask such a lot of you, they are on you all the time, but now, they start playing on their own four times. They disappear outside and they're quite happy to go play in the sandbox and go play with each other. They start to relate to other children. In this space, they don't really notice the other children, except to break down or to demolish what the others have been told them. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really another problem for the parents, especially the mother, because who has to sort out all the battles and all the, or, you know, uh, mop up all the tears. So, of the older children. But, but they, they, they're really not much worried about the others. They are very much on their own, their little world, they will be around everyone, but not so much aware of the other children or playing with the other children. Only when they get to the child place do they now really start interacting positively 
and or negatively, but they start interacting and uh, specifically with other children. They, they say at the age of three that 50%, 50% of the child's attitude in life has been formed. At the age of three, 50%. Do you now see why it has to be positive? Why it has to be acceptance and a blessing? Because at the age of three, 50% of their life attitudes has been formed. It's, it's there. Still half that can be changed and added, but 50% is a lot, eh? That's, that's a lot to, be, to be already see. Um, they know about a thousand words. Between the ages of three to five, they learn the most, the educational people tell us. These are stuff that I've just taken down from um, stuff. It's, it's knowledge that you can go look up. They learn a lot about coordination, their body. Suddenly they start noticing things. Uh, one of the funniest things that I saw was a child discovering her knee. Her knee. <laughs> Knees, both of them. But looking at them, and you can see the wonder of discovering a knee. And I was looking at them, and it was so, I was so in awe of what I saw happening. <laughs> Especially if you are patient enough. It's punishment for the failure. More 
play Spanish with for a parent. But I've learned that thing with my children, and we'll come back to that. It took a lot of out. But learning is takes time, and nobody does it perfect the first time. Nobody. Not even the first few times. So why do we expect our children to do it perfect the first time? And why are we frustrated <coughs> and irritated when it doesn't happen so quickly? Oh, it uh, feels like punishment sometimes. <laughs> but, but let it happen because it's part of the teaching process. All right. Let me just show you a few other things. They must learn to concentrate. That's one thing that, that we... I remember my age group had a huge thing about sitting quiet. Especially in congregations. You will hear a lot of the older people say, oh, we were made to sit still. <laughs> and they make it sound like punishment. The problem is, today, we have all kinds of diseases, if I can put it like that, very gently put, <laughs> like uh, ADHD, and all those amazing things that suddenly kids find it hard to sit still. Was it like that when we were growing up? Quite frankly, it was not that big a problem. But suddenly, it is. And the most important thing about it is not about, it's about how we grew up. We were taught to sit still. It was a specific thing that you teach a child. It doesn't come naturally. It's something you teach them to sit still and now concentrate on this. Obviously, some of them will only concentrate for 10 seconds, but that's all right. In the beginning, it's maybe 10 seconds, and then it becomes longer and longer, but you have to stop. You can't just think that it will just happen. Nothing will just happen by itself. It's something that's taught to children. We'll come back. Uh, discipline, we'll talk a lot about that. They must start making choices. Now, if I say start making choices, in this one you see, it's immediate obedience. Now they can start saying, but mommy, uh, the dog is not being fed yet, so can I do that before I take the ball? Alright, so now obviously they did not do the first court in time because now it's time for ball. So, so yes, but you must now decide, alright, must they still first court or must they first give the dog his food when they are, I mean, this, age, this, this goes on till about 12 or right about there. So we're talking about older children as well. So, now you must make a decision. You've already said this must happen, but now you can say, now, be, no, I understand you must first go feed the dog. You see, so now there's an arguing going on. When they are younger than that, when you said you go take a bath, you go take a bath. <laughs> there's no arguing about it. Now we say, all right, I can see that you, are, you have a valid point, and we go back to that. But they must also make choices. They must know that... Um, they can't go to, to both their friends' birthdays if it's birthday parties if it's at the same time. So they must start making choices. And you must allow them to make those choices because they live with the consequences. And you must teach them that they live with the consequences. So what are the decisions that you make? Don't put too much pressure on them in the beginning. It's a process, remember, it's a process. But they start making choices. And to, to teach them the whole concept of every choice, every decision has consequences. So to follow through on your decision and then to understand that the consequence that comes, whether good or bad, is also part of that decision that you have made. Because as, even as grown-ups, we sometimes try to get out of the consequences. We want the decision, we want the nice things, but we don't always want everything that comes with it. We weren't taught that. Our parents sometimes carried the consequences and made that go away for us. We never had to carry that. But to make your child understand that it's part of life. You, when you've made a decision, you must carry the consequences. It's your decision. So not big things, small things. It's a process. It becomes bigger and bigger as they grow up. Um, good. And then at age five, they speak about 2,500 words. Now, see what we said about three and five. It's more than double. It, it's, it's from 1,000, it's now 2,500 words. So they, they learn what they, they better than parrots. Whatever they hear, they will suck it up and they will repeat it to you. <laughs> so be careful because they do that. And we sometimes, I find that 
That parents think because they are young, we spoke about it earlier, because we think they are cute. We let them get away with what we would not think is cute when it's a grown up. When Christian grown ups use uh, words that we don't think is appropriate, they, we don't laugh. But when a little child does it because they've heard it somewhere, and even though we know it's not appropriate, what do we do? We laugh. Because for the first time to hear a child utter a new word, they say a new word. Even when it's bad, we laugh. Don't we? I've seen many parents do that. And it's not funny. It's part of the process to say, that is not cute. Now sometimes you have to bite on your lip, and you have to turn your face away first and get rid of your smile, and then turn back and say, that's not going to work. Okay? And address the problem. Force that frown there, if anything. Say, listen, no, that's not good. I don't want to hear you say that word. All right? It's not a nice word. It's not a word that we speak in this house. Um, and it would be nice if you could say, if you don't hear mommy and daddy say that. That is the appropriate <laughs> way. <laughs> because that's the right way. Someone said, you said um, that we, 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 we're growing grown-ups. We're training grown-ups. You know, growing children. They're a person in their own right. And how do you always think back, whenever you are training them, how do you want them to look as a grown-up? Because that's what you're training now. Forget that they are only two or six or ten years old. You are training them for adulthood. That's what you're training them for. Not to be just, you know, always so serious. That's what I'm talking about. But always keep in mind when you laugh about things, what you allow, what you don't allow. Think of what it will look like when a grown up does that. They, uh, right. So they, before seven, any person can learn any amount of languages as a mother tongue. But after that, you can still learn a language, but it, you won't have the pronunciation right. You always have an accent after that, because your vocal cords go, go hard. It's a natural process, and the vocal cords go hard, and you cannot pronounce those strange sounds the way it should be. Quite interesting. Before seven, we sometimes think it's a problem if we give them different languages when they are young. And I find parents who are maybe uh, different languages that they, they, they are scared of what shall we say in front of this child, which language should we speak. I'll speak both. They'll take a bit longer to talk, but when they start talking, they will know both languages, which is really amazing because they know what's the difference. They, they listen and they hear and they just pick it up just like that. It's really amazing. Um, okay. Six to seven, they tie quite easily. Watch out for that. Um, it's, it's a bit of a thing where, they, where all of a sudden they, they just go tired. And, and just, when you see stages like that happen, just allow for it. Just just make room for them to, to not ex make excuses for them, but to make sure they get enough rest, make sure they don't go to bed too late, put down definite bedtimes for talking discipline about that again. At eight, they start to think abstract. For the first time, they can actually understand a concept like the Holy Spirit, the spiritual things, because it's abstract, they can't see it. Before eight, they can only think on what they can see. But only after that can they say, oh, but I can understand that it's there even if I can't see it. It only happens off, sometime after eight. At the age of eight, they also start to pull away a bit from the parents. It's like they kind of loosen a bit from the parents and suddenly they discover friends in the real sense of the word and it's really now like a best friend and they, they, they kind of move away a bit. The interesting thing really is that that at the age of about 10 to 11, suddenly you see them in the grown-ups conversation again. And suddenly they are just there, just there, in the shadows, they're just there. Now what do we say when we see that? They're eavesdropping. <laughs> okay? And we are having a grown-up conversation. We don't want you here. So go play. Go play. Now when we started with this phase, the Lord showed me very clearly not to do that, but to allow them to come in because it is the it is the natural way for them to start linking to the grown up world again. Because the next phase that they go through is at puberty, which happens somewhere between well in our society because of all the hormones that we put in our food and all the stuff around us. It starts happening earlier and earlier, but it's supposed to be around about 12, 13. 
traditionally, <coughs> uh, but you could expect it even earlier, um, especially in the girls. We start seeing it earlier and earlier, which isn't always a good thing because it's harder on them and they have to, they're younger and younger and they have to start handling all these things. But puberty, like a physical changes in their bodies, their bodies start to change into puberty, go into puberty. It's, a, it's the physical changes that I'm talking about. It's not just the age of you're now 12, now you are in the next phase. It's the physical changes that happen, their body changing, that huge growth spurts that happening, um, the extra, um, the facial hair for the men that starts, the voice that starts coming up, um, all these things that starts happening physically. If it hasn't happened physically and there's nothing, they are not in the next phase yet. And as I said, with the, as with the previous phase, it takes, it's different times, tables for different children. Don't be in a hurry, or don't, when you see it happening too fast, then, then start to go back into that phase. Yeah, it's too late now. You're into the next phase. Uh, and just to, just to come back to the knowledge thing, make use of this phase. In this phase, they will take everything you say. They are so, they're like, really like sponges, as we've said. Read them, the word. What I love was to, 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 to get stories of the Bible that's just in another, an easier story for. Maybe a whole book just on Jonah or a whole book just on um, Elijah or you, you know what I mean about not just the Bible. Take different children's Bibles. Later on start with the real Bible but still use different stories. Um, even ordinary stories. Get as much knowledge, explore the world with them, see it through their eyes again, help them to understand how does this world work. You are the hero. They love it when their parents tell them, find all kinds of wonderful things. I remember with our oldest daughter, I made the mistake of telling her we were driving. He, he tells the story himself, to his own detriment. But we drove along the road and there were these uh, cows standing there in the field grazing. And he said to her, oh, look at the lovely horses. <coughs> and she's like, horses, horses. And I'm like, no, 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 those are cows. Those are not horses. They're cows. No, they're horses, they're horses. And she was, it took us the best part of more than a year to convince her that those were cows. She just switched the two around. And she, she wouldn't believe me. She wouldn't even believe her father again because he told her they're horses. And if a dad says something, that's the truth. <laughs> and we learned that way not to lie to our children. Not to tell, tell them half truths or untruths, but to be to be clear about things. And how easy it is to convey knowledge and how they will just slip to her. It's, it's amazing. So, um, so yeah. Now we come to the next phase, the young adult phase. You... Maybe some of you will know this with, to some of you it will be quite new. <laughs> uh, let me just put the page there. This is between, let's say 12, 13, but you know what I said about it. Um, maybe at different phases or age groups of the puberty. Now they are young adults. <coughs> and you might have missed this, but if you go back to the Bible and you start searching, you will see many, many places where it talks about a young man, a young woman, or a young adult. Not a teenager. Not a teenager. If you have immediate obedience in this space, you will not have a terrible two. If you did that, and you built right, you will not have a difficult teenager if you put the foundation of these previous phases there. And I can promise you, it does not matter what their personality or their giftings are, you will not have a difficult teenager. We did not have that. Especially when watching out for that thing of going away a bit and then 10, 11, coming back and sitting there. They are preparing, not always, they will do it here and there and then more and more you will see them and then eventually if you draw them in, you can make them part of the adult conversation, which of course you must now know to talk the right things. And sometimes you can say, listen now, today, please go play. We, we are talking now specifically with this person about something personal. Um, would you go play? And then you understand, I'm not talking about exposing them to everything, but on general to allow them into the adult conversation so that they can prepare, so that at this phase, in all the cultures, except the Western culture, we have an initiation ceremony. In all the cultures, 
except the Western culture, they have an initiation <coughs> in which they are accepted as young adults. Part of the adult world, but they are apis. They are apprentices. Why? To start practicing what we've now taught them. Not for them to sit around any longer and be told to sit there, you're a child, wait until you're old enough. Now, that's what I was talking about earlier, about not letting them grow up too fast, but then holding them back in this space. Because in our culture, when they get to 12, 13, now we tell them, no, you're not old enough. Why do you want to sit with the adults? Why do you want to do the things we do? See, now we want to keep them children. And that's why we have difficult teenagers. Because they are frustrated. They want to start living life. They have more energy than in any other phase in their life. They want to start doing things that we do, that they see, that see their parents do, and their parents' friends do, and the community do. They want to start doing things, and we won't allow them. Now, obviously, obviously, there's still restrictions. Like, they can't start driving the car when they just go into the space. But you do understand that it's part of the space. So for them to also understand, no, 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 there will come a time, or maybe on a farm or somewhere, if, if it's safe, you can, you can start driving a little bit. There's things that we can allow them. But within limits, you understand that? It's also a process of them growing into it. But at that, uh, this age, not to tell them, no, you can't bake a cake, you're too young. Or even when they're younger, I remember my, my daughters were all around about nine when they said, now they want to bake a cake. I said, go for it. Go for it. Which recipe? No, this one. I said, do you know where everything is? Yes, I know where everything is. I said, all right, I'm going to leave. You, go, you bake the cake. Because by then, they've helped me many times. When they say, I want to bake the cake, I leave. Because it's their cake. If I stay there, then I keep interfering. So I leave. <laughs> Mostly also because they make a mess. And I can't do it like that. I can't see them make a mess in my kitchen. So I leave. <laughs> and then they bake the cake. And then I can be excited about the cake. You see. For them to, to have that room to grow. In this phase, we have them uh, to really get where's that thing? Um, get to know their identity. It's all about um, discovering their own identity. Not just their identity, but specifically as part of that, their gifts. Who am I? What can I do? What am I good at? Because now they grow up and they are physically, they are, uh, they are an adult size. So they can now do what we can do. So what are you good at? What do you want to try? What hobbies, even if it's just a hobby and it never goes any further than that? Well, would you like to try that? Then let's get it to someone who can teach you. Even if the viewers parent cannot teach them, get them to someone who can teach them. And, and let them try different things. Obviously within your budget, and if you if you really feel they must do something, trust the Lord for it. Make it a, a faith project for them as well. But for them to really start discover themselves specifically. What do I like? And what am I good at? Who am I? Start speaking into their lives very specifically. Have them do courses if you if you can. Um, there are different personality courses. Start uh, that they can discover themselves, that they can understand who they are and what they are good at and what they can do, and that they are different, and that they don't have to do the same things as their brothers or sisters. And for me, it's one of the most amazing things in, in, in our family. We we taught the children to um, to appreciate each other's gifts, and if I see the way in which they um, they really rely on each other's gifts. There are specific things where they will specifically go to one who has a specific gift. Then they will all go to the other one for something else that needs to be done. Not for, for that one to do it for them always, but at least to show them. Because that one is better than they are. And it's, it's often things that I, I even go to that child and say, show me, you're better at this. <laughs> um, if, if a cake needs to be baked, I'm very sorry. I, I, I say, I'll do the donkey work. I'll wash the dishes, but your cake's better than mine. There are things that I do better, I'll do it for you. But 
that thing you must now help me with. <laughs> I'm not that good. Come back when it needs to be decorated, then, then I can I can hide my mistakes, but uh, <laughs> and I, I've, I've learned a few tricks now. I'm getting, they taught me. They, they taught me some of my mistakes, which is amazing. When you can now in this space start learning from your children even, because they now discover things that they can do good, start listening to them. Start helping them to see that you, you accept them as a young adult, as on the same level. Yes, of course you still have the authority. Of course you will always be the parent. But now also you start giving away that authority. It's no longer like in the, in the, in the suckling phase like this, and then in the child phase your arms are like this. They can play around in here, but you are there, around them, all the time. But when they grow young adults, you open up your arms and you say, I'm here, I'm right behind you, but you try, you do this now. So, so, and the most amazing thing is when you tell them they can do this, and that's what an initiation phase does. The initiation ceremony tells them you can do this because you are now an adult. We accept you as an adult. So because you're an adult and you can now at least try it, now when they can't get it right, because we told them they can do it, they come running back to us and say, I'm having trouble with this. Help me. They're not in a rebellion because they don't have to prove anything. There's nothing they can prove. Because a teenager wants to prove that they are capable of being an adult. That's, that's all. They rebel against you because they can prove they can do it. I'm saying, sure you can do it. I know you can do it. So come for it. And then they don't have to prove anything. They don't have to go into rebellion to prove it because I, I've given them permission to do it. Within limits of, of law and you understand specific phases within this, this thing. But you start opening up and you start letting them make the decisions in a growing phase. We can talk about specific things later on in the course. Right, um, in, if I can just look at specific... Oh yes, I want to talk about the whole thing of their own free will. Um, what is freedom really? Freedom is, um, if my freedom starts, if, if my freedom starts to restrict your freedom, it's no longer freedom. A horse that just runs wild out there. I always heard about these stories of the horses of the Camargue that runs free in the sea, and I read about it the other day as well. And you all that feeling like nice wild horses just running in the field. They look so lovely. Can we do anything with them? They cannot pull a wagon. They cannot help. They cannot run a race. There's nothing. We can just look at them. They're nice to admire, but that's it. They're no use to, to everyone else. Okay? But a horse that can be put into submission can start pulling a load and they can start having. They're not just nice. They're not just, we can, we can really start, they can be part of the team. And that's the idea, because we are part of a team. We are part of this world. We're not individuals on our own. We must, that's what society is about, is we're now out of our homes to go into the bigger society and become part of the team, wherever it's supposed to be part of the team. And that's what we're raising them for, is to become part of the team. That's what submission is about. It's not about putting laws on you. It's not about restricting you. It's not about being difficult on you, but saying there are rules in, in society. There are limits to what we can do in specific situations, how we must behave and what we can do and say and not say in specific situations. To, to guard against someone else's freedom and their, guard their hearts, not to just say what we want, when we want, where we want. Um, and that's what, what raising them is all about. To get them to a place where they are um, grown adults. Now adulthood comes when, uh, we can talk a lot about all the specific things, just something interesting, they say at 19 to 20, 90 percent of life's habits are formed. All your life habits at 19 to 20, 90 percent of them are formed. They're fixed. Which is true. Yeah, university, but it's also part because we, we're 19, 20, we are there now, so we start doing a lot of things and, which we don't always keep. But they also say, and statistics say, that People who become alcoholics started drinking before that age, before 19 to 20. 98% of alcoholics started before the age of 19. Interesting. 
So it's, it's, it's really, it's something that we must think about and really help our kids and help them. It's not easy. It's not easy to grow up. It's hard to grow up. And it's not always nice, but to, to help them. To, to help them to be that apprentices who can start trying out their own freedom and try out their own needs and do things. Don't frustrate them. And don't try to keep them children in. They're not children anymore. They want to grow up. Um, so this one, I only picked this one up. I'm sorry, I didn't. I was actually at married two and I, I didn't realize I didn't. But it's not just marriage that brings you into adulthood. It's, it's, uh, that's one of the things that brings you into adulthood. But it, it can also be independence, complete, a little bit like this, more financial independence. When you start paying your own bills, you're an adult. When you take care of your own life, you no longer, even if you may still live in your father or mother's home, but you pay your own bills and you bring your body and you are an adult. It, 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 you could be an adult at 19. You could be an adult at 30. It's up to you. Are you taking responsibility? I see children, children, living in their parents' homes at the age of 40, sponging off their parents. They're children. They're still young adults. They haven't taken up responsibility for their lives. Because when you get to adulthood, what is the word that we use there of that phase? Uh, oh, sorry. Responsibility. Responsibilities. When you take responsibility for yourself, complete responsibility for yourself and for others, you are now an adult. It doesn't matter when it happens. It can happen at, as I said, it can happen at 18. Some people go, I know some of my friends that in, the, in our generation, their parents just said, we can't pay for your studies. We can't give you any money. There you go. They started training as nurses where they... They were given housing and they were given food and maybe even a little bit of pocket money, but they were on their own, so they were adults in my eyes. They were taking full responsibility. There's no more help from the parents' side. They were adults. Okay, but mostly I think it's meant to be to be with, I think in our society today, we, 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 it's more financial responsibility, but I think it was, especially with women, it could be marriage. When you get married and you are now completely on your own, because even if people get uh, go out of the house, the parents still help here and there, but when marriage comes, it's like that final, final thing of, okay, now you're on your own. There you go. Like, yay! <laughs> Got my money for myself again, the parents will sometimes think, and more or less, until the grandkids come and then see them pay. <laughs> but, um, but, but you get the feeling of, of there's something physical like marriage or financial um, independence. Where you now pay your own way and you're not spanning off your parents anymore. And that brings you into adulthood, which is all about responsibility. And, and in independence, adulthood teaches you that it's not being independent. That's not what an adult is. An adult is interdependent. It means I take care of others. I don't, I, I don't need others, but I choose to be around others and to take responsibility for them and to get help from them, you, you learn that's, that's what maturity is, is to, to be interdependent um, and then you are grown. So that's about all the phases. Are there any questions maybe? Something I left out. Something we haven't said about this <coughs> phase, maybe because I just go back to that, is a, is a huge thing, is the whole, um, not just sexual, but emotional development during this phase um, is is to help our kids to, Andrew Murray said, to, to have them keep their uh, spirits calm. So the only way you can hear God if you are if you are quiet. And if there's always a lot of emotional turmoil, you cannot hear God's voice. And that's what you must learn to hear in this phase, especially is to hear God's voice for yourself. Because now you must start to apply what you've learned and you must hear God's voice for that. So if you can't be quiet in your spirit, then there's a lot of turmoil. And, and all these relationships, and I know it's strange for some people, but most of people who know us have heard us talk about that. And I think there's a huge movement around the world to say that maybe we should just wait, at least until we finish with school, to start dating and start 
whatever you call it. I don't care what you call it, but but just put the relationship thing with the opposite sex just out of the way until at least until I'm finished with school, so that I can take hold of my own identity, so that I can discover myself properly and not be sidetracked by this emotions in me. Uh, it's it's and, and and we we bring that on ourselves. Uh, we, we, it's part of our society where it's acceptable to to put in that. But it also brings a lot of problems for us in that we also learn patterns which later becomes difficult to, to lay aside. We, 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 uh, they say that in, in my generation, which we're around about the 50s now, or between I think 40 and 60, that generation would have uh, been into relationships in school about three different relationships. Now, a few years back, we asked, and the teachers <coughs> told us now they have around about between 10 and 20 relationships during their school years. Now, imagine just going into relationships with that intensity because just watch them when it breaks up. And it's, in, it's like a divorce. It's like a mini divorce. They are, they are in turmoil. They are upset, and understandably so. Because emotions, once you which, once you start um, applying them, they, when, you, when you start uh, linking yourself emotionally to someone, it's hard when it breaks up, especially when you're younger. You don't understand always, and but it's a it's practicing for for the whole show. really. Because now it's so easy. If I don't like you anymore, I can just walk out of this relationship. So what do I do in marriage? Well, I don't like this marriage anymore. I can just up and go. Um, and remember what we said, it's practice. We are practicing for adulthood. So just as, as a note on that, uh, don't have to take my word for it, but I do think we must seriously consider putting down a new way, but at least during your school years, to say, I'm not ready to get married. It's, it's, it's not part of the picture to get married when I'm in school, at least. So don't even go there. Just enjoy each other, just get to know how men think, how girls think. Just enjoy each other in the group and go have fun. Just have fun things to do. And, and, and keep your emotions pure so that you have time, you have energy to discover yourself and to discover other people around you. Any other questions? Um, do you enforce this? Or do you give them a choice in this? I mean, no, we in the young adult phase, do you tell them you will not date in school or how do you handle it? Two things, both sides. When they were wet, very young, and, and I think for me it was very <coughs> upsetting once we started hearing about this whole concept to see how early it actually starts. To hear adults talk about it, seeing two babies lying on a blanket of the opposite sex and saying, oh, they're such a cute little couple. A couple. You heard that? You seen them? Oh, give them a kiss. You know, it's like, give them a kiss. You know, it's like, you know. And the parents do that. The grown-ups do that. So I started looking at that and saying, but, but we are training them. We are telling them it's okay to do this. So I started telling them it's not okay to do this. No, no, no. No, 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 no. We're just playing. Just go play. And then the friends would come visit and they would say, the, the, our kids would be upset and saying, but they say, that is the case with that one. I'm now his special friend or whatever you call it in English. Sorry, I'm not sure. <laughs> and then they would, then, then I would call the kids together. And, and really, my knees were shaking. The first time this was hard on me, I was thinking, oh my goodness, no, what's going to happen now? But I called them all together. So I said, Oh, I hear you saying that. Yes, 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 Tommy. They were all no problem because in school this is this is old story. No problem for them. They were quite confident. This is it. And I'm like, uh, oh, so you you ready to get married? No, 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 no. I'm like, well, if you're not ready to get married, then what nonsense are you talking? Sorry, you are friends, all of you, all of you. You're just friends. Don't come tell me stories like this. Not gonna happen. You're just friends. And I would immediately, even if when they were even younger, and the parents would say, I would say, please don't say that. It's not part of how we train our children. It's, it's, it's not necessary. Wait, we'll come at the right time. And then when they become, when they get to the, to the puberty, 
uh, we have initial thing, we have initiation phase. Um, there's a worldwide thing standing up where some people call it the silver ring thing, others call it uh, we call it the butt of the bar baraka, which is uh, it's a Christian equivalent for the bar or the bat mitzvah. Uh, the bar or bat mitzvah means son or daughter of the law. Uh, this one calls means son or daughter of the blessing. Now you can just call it son or daughter of the blessing. Uh, but 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 it's a very specific thing that parents all over the world are starting to do. Christian parents. We have a specific um, time where we say uh, that's your day that we will now pronounce you a young adult as your feast. You can choose what kind of food you want there, the clothes you want to wear. Obviously, it's special clothes. We make a big deal of it uh, within our budget, but we make a big deal of it. We have a, we decorate. It's like a feast, and we call all the people that's involved with this child, all the friends, all the. Um, grandparents, maybe if there's teachers, music teachers, whoever has an influence on this child's life, and we invite them, we all um, tell them to, or invite them to, to say something into their lives, to speak to their lives, maybe give them a prophetic word, maybe give them just a blessing, or just tell them what you appreciate about them, what you see in their lives that's, that's wonderful, that you love, and that you see as specific to them. And then beforehand, we tell the kids, all right, what we would like you to do is to go into, uh, and they, they call it a covenant, but you don't need to make it so serious sounding, but go into an agreement with us not to be involved emotionally in a relationship with someone of the opposite sex until you are older, uh, at least after school. And, and we had no thing that, because I was very young, I was and not even 20 when we were married. So so I had no problem with my kids getting married young, which seems they don't want to do now after all, but <laughs> <laughs> I wish they would. I really have no problem with that. When the right one comes, we'll know it, and it's great, it's it's good. Let it happen, allow them to, to get married. But, um, but wait when you're in school, and we ask them to pray about it and to think about it. It's not a law, it's not a must. If they came to us and said, no, they really didn't want to, and later, when they were older, some of them did come and say, they're not sure if this is the way they want to do it. And we said, that's your option, but, well, then they were older already, so for us, we at least saved them for those young adult years, those teenage years, where we said they could be quiet and just do fun things and just develop themselves. So I think if you just, especially the way we were in a group at that phase where all the parents did it, and, and the kids would come in, more families would come in, but it was, a, it was accepted and everyone could relax because nothing was expected of you. They were not an accept thing that, over oh, I'm with no one, so I'm odd out. Nobody had anyone and it wasn't expected of you to have anyone. So they could just relax and just be themselves. And, and that helps a lot. But even if you just explain, I think we can still do it. There are a lot of the kids like, um, some of them were in school. And, and they just said to their friends, I'm sorry, we, we don't do that, and I'm fine with that, and I just want to be friends. And if you can't accept that, then sorry, but I would just like to be friends. And uh, yeah, but it depends on that child, if they are they, then it's their decision. They must enforce, because especially if they're in school, they must enforce it. They must follow through on it. If, if they are in the school, you can't be there, you can't see what's happening, and, and they're old enough, you can't force them. I don't believe that you should force them at this age. We ask them and we say, it's part of the ceremony, do you want this part as well? And they agreed at that stage and we lived like that. Um, but it's not a it's, it's not a rule. I think it just saves them from a lot of hurt. Um, I used to say it's like saving up your emotional energy. That first time is always the time that you cling the tightest. That emotional link is the very, very fast at that stage. And he said, it's like, if you, if you can't use your pocket money to buy something big, you save for it. The same with, with that. You want that, that lifelong relationship to be very, very tight and secure. You want to, to really cling. What's, what's the word that the, the word used? To, to die, uh, yeah, to cling. I think it's cling. I'm not sure what the English Bible says. Uh, and they will be one well, to clean. That's the word. Um, that clean, we want it to be absolute. And, and the longer we can, the, 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 the more we come into that first relationship, there's no hurt. There's no preconceived ideas yet. 
So the first one is always the, the typist. So why do we want it to be at 13 or 14 and we can't get married? Um, but if we save our emotional energy for later, um, yeah, that's the, that's the basic idea behind it. And I, I, I still think, in retrospect, I still think I'll get to that. But it's up to the, it's up to them. We don't have to them. And if they then go into a relationship, we accept them. We don't always say we agree, we accept them. We accept the other person and we reach out to them and we allow them to visit together and, and it's their decision. They must live with the consequences. They've been re raised like that. It's your consequence. It's your consequence. Uh, I can't tell you to do that or not to do that. We try to, to, to tell you this is maybe the consequences. If you've forgotten, this is what might happen. But we'll be there for you. 